I was using private money as often as I could. And I would go to hard money when I ran out of private money. Um, and it was years before I could get another bank loan because even when my short sales and foreclosures were old enough that I could get a bank loan, um, I ran into the common problem of investors where I, I everything is um, deducted or sheltered and it doesn't look like you make any money. You can't qualify for debt to income ratio or you, don't, you just don't make enough money. Um, so I didn't qualify for a loan until you know, like two years ago, 2019. <clears throat> Um, and uh, now I now I'll go to a bank. Um, I'll take a bank loan over a private loan any day now, just because rates are so good. They're, I mean, they're paying me to borrow their money if I factor in inflation. All right, guys, here we go now. It is time to unlock more doors to deals. We're real estate investors here. We're real estate agents here, and we all have one thing in common. We believe that we can. We can live the life of our purpose. We can create financial freedom. We can build a better life for those that we love, and we can live the life of our dreams. I don't care if you're trying to do your first deal or your 500th this year, you can get to the next level, and we're here to help. Hey, welcome to Doors to Deals. I'm your host and founder, Jim Manning. Today's episode can be found on doorstodeals.com slash 069. So today we have David Haberfield on the line. Uh, David and I um, uh, are newer friends. I, I got the opportunity to get to know him uh, better at a networking conference uh, in Tampa a few months ago. And and man, this guy's a, a fun guy to interview and a fun guy to have a beer with too. But anyway, David's... Um, uh, David's been a, a, a pretty darn successful investor for a number of years now, and he brings a wealth of, of knowledge on uh, not just investing in real estate, but also just kind of being a owner operator and a, a business owner in general. Uh, so today we're going to dive into um, different investing opportunities, different things that he has going on right now. And um, we run the gamut. We talk about a weed business. We talk about uh, a sub shop. We talk about a ton of things in this episode and it's just a tremendous amount of fun. And, um, anytime I can get, uh, the opportunity to, uh, interview a really smart owner operator, uh, I always get a lot out of it and I really, I really enjoy it because I enjoy, uh, listening in and, and hearing, uh, someone else that's, that's really smart and really accomplished, uh, hearing how they think and and how they uh, look at opportunities and look at investment opportunities and and um, uh, this was a good one, guys. I'm excited to bring it to you. Uh, before we get started, I am. Um, I just wanted to send you just give you a quick reminder. Um, if we help about one hundred thirty thousand dollar one hundred thirty thousand dollars a month. Uh, our team helps generate um, in passive income. And if you are looking for some passive income investing opportunities in real estate, uh, we have some great ones available. So make sure you just send us over an email, deals at three doors.com. And uh, we help our agents and our agents' clients uh, generate all that passive income. So it's uh, one of the things I'm most proud about, uh, about all the things that we have going on, the several hundred deals a year and all that. Uh, but man, that's like the, the number one thing that, that I think is so special. And, and that's, it's really what our mission is, uh, was we're trying to give people not only, uh, treasure, uh, but we're trying to give them their time so that they can do whatever they, um, whatever they want with it. And, um, uh, I can't think of a better blessing, uh, than helping somebody become financially free to, um, uh, to do for, for an individual. And, and that's a big part of why we're doing what we're doing. So, um, so before we get started on this interview, uh, let's get going with the iTunes review of the week. This week's review comes to us from R.E. Kell titled, An Honest Look, five stars. Kell writes, I enjoy listening to an honest look at the ups and downs of real estate investing, learning something new every time I tune in. Check this podcast out. These guys are really, really knowledgeable and know what they're doing with real estate investing. Kel, thank you for your review. Jim, back to you. All right, guys. It's time to get rolling. Let's get started with the interview. All right. What's up, guys? Jim here. Just another episode of Doors to Deals. Uh, Ryan here is going to be um, on the mic with me as well. And we're interviewing a, a friend of ours, David. Um, uh, 
Now, David, I don't think I've ever had to say your last name, Haberfield or Haberfeld. What's Haberfeld. the Haberfeld? Okay, yeah, there's no I you got it. Yeah, there is no I. So David ha- David Haberfeld, and maybe the reason I'm struggling with his last name so much is because every time I've seen the guy, we've been we've been a few beers deep at a happy hour or or at a networking event or whatnot. This is the most sober we've ever like communicated and talked with each other. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Funny how that happens. Huh? Yeah, funny how that happens. The last time we were hanging out was in in Tampa at a uh, kind of like a influencer <laughs> event. It was a really good time, but. Anyway, so enough about my drinking habits and David's drinking habits. Let's get going into this. Um, so why don't you give kind of like the, the quick couple minute uh, background on uh, kind of like your story and how you got into real estate and so we learned a little bit more about you. Sure. Um, so my start is very traditional. Um, go to school, study, get good grades, get a job, save your money. You know, I had no entrepreneurial upbringing, but it was always in me, I guess. And so I got into real estate in 2006, uh, started as a landlord. Uh, I did a very poor job, did not have a mentor or someone to guide me. Um, my first four properties ended up being uh, two foreclosures, one short sale and uh, one modification. Um, but I didn't give up on it. Um, became a landlord, got as high as about 140 units. Um, I'm down to about 90 now. I've been selling off as the market's been hot. Um, I'm into some other businesses trying to diversify uh, out of real estate, not out of real estate, partially out of real estate, just because I, I can't tell what the future looks like for real estate. Um, but yeah, I've been doing this for 15 years and uh, it's been a pretty good ride. So uh, so oh, I started oh, in 2000. Oh, okay, go ahead. So yeah, we started at the same time, 2006. So wait a second, let's take a step back. So your first four deals, that was how you bought them or that was what happened after you bought them? That's what happened after I bought them. So I, I just, I had a W2 job in good credit. You know, I just paid my bills. So when I went to go buy my first property, they're like, oh yes, sir, here you go. And like at that time, the market was super hot, kind of feel similar to today. And you had to overpay to get anything. I did not know how to calculate cash flow. I just picked a house that looked good to me. And I said, yes. And then I did it again and again and again. And I filled out that little form that says you're going to own or occupy and live in every one of them because everybody was doing that. And I didn't know I wasn't supposed to do that. And so it was zero down for my first four properties. None of them cash flowed. And I was in a mess from day one. Gotcha. So, okay. So you, at at that point, how old are you? 27. You're 27 years old. You have a W-2 job and you have four properties. And so when does the downfall, I presume, happens in 08? Starts happening? So so in 08, um, when the market crashed, I knew my value wasn't there, but in rental properties, you know, your your rent still comes in. Um, So no, I, I I went fine through 08. I actually started buying more properties before I lost these properties. So I was, you know, as the market went down a little bit, I was like, oh, cool. Like, this is more. But the bank told me no, because, you know, that was what the crisis was, is that banks stopped lending money. So I did my first deal as a uh, seller financing. I didn't even know the word seller financing meant. I just kind of stumbled into it. And then I started borrowing private money. And I kept buying all the way down. But around 2011 or 2012, I finally came to the realization that there was no way out for these first four properties. And I just picked a calendar year. I think it was like January 1st. I think it was 12. I lasted like four years. I just stopped paying the mortgage on all four of them. And I gave up on my credit because there was no way out. So, um, you know, what's, what's interesting is, is I, um, um, I kind of give myself a hard time. I, I did one deal in my first 18 months and you're the first person I think that has me beat David. Uh, your first four deals that you did in like your first year, you, you, you lost all of them. So congratulations on that. <laughs> yeah. I had a, I had a tough start, man. I, uh, if I had it all to do over again, you know how people are like, Oh, I have no regrets. I, you know, this is what taught me what I know today. No, that's crap. I have regrets. I wish I had a mentor or found, uh, you know, my local RIA or, or found someone who knew it, who knew how to do this business and asked them questions. And I didn't do any of that because it didn't occur to me to find someone who was doing what I wanted to do and ask them how to do it. So I'm sure you've thought about this more a lot more than just this quick little thought that came to my mind, but I have to ask this a little bit. So you say you have the regret. So instead of you have the regret 
because you feel like you could have been better with a mentor, even though I presume that that experience helped you grow in some way, shape or form, correct? Oh, yes, absolutely. It was a very, very educational experience. Um, but if you look at, you know, if you look at a real estate career as a, as a journey, you know, my journey could have been shorter if I didn't have such a rough start. Gotcha. You know? So let me ask you this. If you hadn't bought those first four properties, do you still think you would have been in real estate? Like, do you still think you would have taken the plunge? So I'm not sure. No one's asked me that one before. Um, I knew I wanted to do it. If I knew how to calculate cash flow, I would not have bought any of those four. And at that time, there was probably nothing that cash flowed. So I don't know when I would have taken the plunge. I probably, I probably would have had to wait till after the crash to take the plunge on a multifamily. But after that, banks stopped lending. So maybe I couldn't have gotten a loan even with good credit. And so that's a good question. I don't know if, uh, I don't know how or when I would have gotten into real estate if I didn't start then. Well, sorry, real quick. I want to continue on that thought process. It, it was that uh, also, you know, if, and maybe, maybe you can look at it this way. I don't know. I'm just trying to see if, if this was more of a positive than what you give it credit for, which is, you know, you bought. So have you done some coaching and teaching in, in your career? Uh, I have never been the coach. I, I help out friends just, you know, okay. I give advice freely now, but I've never done any formal coaching or uh, training. Gotcha. So the reason I was asking that is because we have done some coaching and, uh, as, and doing training or helping people as you have, you know, the, the toughest step. And we, we sometimes forget this because we've been in business now for 15 years. The toughest step is that first step to go in, right? So the fact that you did take, you know, that step. Yeah. I mean, it kind of sucks how it ended up, but I'll give you all the credit well, in the I, world for, uh, for jumping on and doing it. Well, I challenge Ryan, I challenge you on it sucks how it ended up because how it ended up was he owns, he owned 140 units. He sold off 50, you, got you know what I mean? And like, <laughs> I mean, how, how, those, how those four houses ended was up, I guess. pretty dang amazing is yeah. how it ended up. No, the total, um, total story. How, heck yeah. Um, so, all right. So like the thing that I'm curious about, let's elaborate more on. So your credit was going to got dinged a few years later, but you decided you didn't even need credit um, to kind of keep investing. So, so what was your model there? How, how were you pulling that off? Oh, so it was it was a struggle, but I was uh, I was using private money as often as I could, and I would go to hard money when I ran out of private money, um, and it was years before I could get another bank loan because even when my short sales and foreclosures were old enough that I could get a bank loan, um, I ran into the common problem of investors where I, I everything is um, deducted or sheltered, and it doesn't look like you make any money. You can't qualify for debt to income ratio, or you, don't, you just don't make enough money. Um, so I didn't qualify for a loan until you know, like two years ago, 2019. <clears throat> um, and uh, now, I, now I'll go to a bank. Um, I'll take a bank loan over a private loan any day now just because rates are so good. They're, I mean, they're paying me to borrow their money if I factor in inflation. What terms did you negotiate with the private lenders on the buy and hold? <laughs> so I just made up the numbers based on what I thought was okay. Um, if it was a long-term hold, like a three-family house, I was giving out 7%. And if it was a flip, I was giving 10%. And the reason was because uh, the money would come in and out sometimes. Um, so it wasn't always working for them. And um, that worked for a lot of my private investors. I had six or seven. And you know, I was able to borrow you know, a couple million that way. And it allowed me to you know, do some flips and own some rentals and you know, carry on. That's awesome. You you borrowed it better than we do. Seven percent is great rate. You know, these days I um I pay I pay ten percent for most things, but I'm not using private money for rentals. Yeah. Because now I'll now I'll do a bank loan for rentals now that I can. Um, but I'm still borrowing for flips privately at ten percent. So all right, so you did the so tell me a little bit more kind of like on the the journey up to the 140 uh, units, like. Like kind of like what happened there and, you know, uh, as, as you're kind of building your empire, so to speak. So I moved to this uh, city called Bristol, Connecticut, and that's where I bought my first properties. I moved here because I bought here and 
I just like got really involved in the town. Like I, le- I learned my market really well. And I was, you know, I was like going down to the local bar and hiring people at the bar to work on my places and stuff. And like, I knew all the people walking around and I knew, I knew this guy was a drug dealer and I knew this guy was a contractor. I knew this guy was going to need a place. And, you know, I just like knew all my locals, you know? And, um, I, at one time I had a dream to like buy this whole like city block, uh, which never came close to materializing, but I ended up with a bunch of buildings around here. Um, and I pretty much focused in Bristol. So I went to other towns as time went on, but, um, I just kept acquiring anything I could. Also, until 2014, I think it was, um, I had never sold one. I was only buying from 2006 to 2014. In 14 is when I first sold one. It was like, I don't know if you guys, if you guys remember, it was seven years ago now, but it was like flipping a switch. Banks weren't lending, and then all of a sudden, banks started lending again. Oh, yeah. And it, I'm pretty sure I was 14, if I remember right. And all of a sudden, people could buy houses. And so some of the worst ones I had, I'm like, well, I don't want that one anymore. So I sold it. And I was like, oh. Look at that. I got I got one big check instead of making like, you know, seventy five dollars a door on these shitty houses. And that was great. And it made me want to do more. And then I started flipping. I started uh, pivoting with the change in the market. It became a good market for flipping. So then, so at, at that point in time in 2014, how many did you own? Uh, 2014, I was probably. I was probably, I was, uh, I don't know, 120, 125, something like that. And so you really conscious and made a, a concerted effort to pick and choose the ones you wanted. I have, and I, and I continue to do that even more today. Um, I have, I am selling off properties sometimes not because of the math, not because of the dollars. I will look at a property and say, you know what? I hate this house. It's emotional more than it is uh, financial. I don't want to be a landlord in this city. I'm going to sell off in this city. And I can, and I have the luxury to do that, which is probably the opposite of what I would advise anyone starting out to do. Um, but I have the luxury of doing that because I have a portfolio where I can cherry pick, um, and I'm diversified now. So I can, I can do that. So when you say that, so you have a specific area or a specific niche, what is your, your, like your buy box, your buy or, box now. yeah yeah or so i mean or sorry you even said you might not be buying so elaborate on that so right now in real estate i'm just looking for value but i don't have anything that i wouldn't sell um i have not bought a rental property to keep this year not one um and if i find a three family i will try to you know stabilize it up the rents renovate it if it needs it but i'll put that same three family back on the market um it's just such a strong uh strong pricing these days you can't convince me that it's not a good idea to sell at what i perceive to be the peak of the market so real quick let's talk about that we have no buys this year how many sells um you know i actually have that so when i say no buys that means no rental property so i've bought flips okay got it so bought property to flip yeah so um yeah, I'm fairly even, but it's mostly because it's flips. I've bought bought five, sold six. Okay, this year. So, which is actually a pretty slow year for me. Um, my best uh, my best year was 19. I had uh, 39 closings, so that's 19 and a half flips was my best year. Awesome. Yeah, I guess part of it is your rental portfolio is still bringing in enough revenue that you can kind of. You know, you don't have to go out and try and do a hundred deals and, and do all that hustle for that, right? Yeah, I am I am not I haven't scaled like crazy. I, I'm not the uh I'm not the guy that can ever do a hundred deals in a year. I just don't think I have the organizational skill. Um, but I can do I now honestly the year that I did the 19 and a half flips, um, that was a very tough year for me. I was not efficient. Um I learned a lot where I think I could do it today. Um, but it wasn't it wasn't a fun year for me. It doesn't uh you know, people always choose their own measurements. And they're, if they're like, Hey, you know, look at me, I did, you know, 20 flips. I mean, they don't also say that that was like one of your most miserable years because that was, it was, uh, it wasn't a great year for me this year. You know, if I do, if I do, uh, you know, eight flips this year, this year is way better than the year I did 19, 20 flips. Um, it's more fun. I got more time off. I worked less hours. Um, the flips that I am doing are going better. I'm more efficient at them. Um, and it's uh, 
I would take a year like this year over a year like 2019 outside of the virus stuff any day. Yeah, no joke. I, I, I appreciate you bringing that up because we've experienced the exact same thing. Our, our highest volume, which uh, you said yours was 2019. Or I don't think yep. you said we were 2018. Weren't it we? was 2019 as well. Our <laughs> our highest volume was 2019, and and it was it was a lot of volume and not as much fun as we've had since. So wholeheartedly agree with that sentiment. Yeah, it's all about how you measure. You know, if you measure if you measure success and how many dollars you made, mm. that's only one measurement. If you measure your your success and how many days of vacation you got in a year, well, that's very different, right? Oh, yeah. How many? So then, what was done, yeah. what was the the switch for you? I know you're part of leadership boardroom, so you had a 2019 where you did a ton of deals, and it wasn't as fun. So, how did you see that in your business and in your life? So, October of 2019 is when I joined leadership boardroom, and that is what made the difference. That was um, awesome. That was it. I didn't I didn't understand balance at all like um it seems so obvious in hindsight but like i just didn't know working uh 40 50 60 hours a week was very normal um 80 at a bad week if things are going wrong and you know i don't i don't have to do that anymore um but i didn't know i was doing anything wrong i liked working i liked making money the harder you work the more hours you work the more money you make that's what you think but that's actually not true but i didn't know it wasn't tr- untrue until three years ago right can you elaborate a little bit on that? <laughs> the more hours you work, the more the more you make, um, and, that, and how that's not true. Can you expand on that? Sure. I mean, um, you know, so like people think that's true because they're always used to working by the hour at like a W two job, um, but that absolutely does not translate when once you join the investor class. Um, I delegate everything that I possibly can. I delegate some of the stupidest things because I, I just want to try to, I, I try to never do anything is the goal, like do minimal, minimal anything, which I mean, not, and not in a lazy way, but like, in a the more that I delegate, the more that I can accomplish, you know? So um, as an example, and this is, this is something I actually learned from Robin Thompson uh, early on um, when she says that um, the less I do, the more I make. And I didn't even understand what the, what the hell she was talking about. Cause that didn't make any sense. And then she's like, you know, I don't clean my house. I hire a house cleaner. Uh, I don't put gas in my car. I have my assistant do it. I don't go to the post office. I have my assistant do it. I don't mow the lawn. I don't, you know, I don't do this. And she starts, you know, passing off all of these tasks. And I'm like, oh, well, I hate doing all those things too. So I'd like to pass them off, but I don't have enough money to pass all that off. And so once you make a little money and you start passing that off, you realize that you have more time in your life to do the things that you're good at and do the things that make things that make the most money. So I always tell people that if you focus on your strengths, if you work 40 hours a week, but you spend all 40 doing what you are absolutely best at in life. So let's say there's 500 tasks you can be doing in your life and you're good at 50 of them. And the other 450, you either don't like them, you're not good at them. If you, um, if you delegate those other 450 tasks and you do the 50 tasks that you're best at all the time, you will look like a genius and a rock star for the rest of your life. And I try to get as close to that as I can. So, uh, so what is your kind of like your unique genius zone or like the, the 50 things that you're the 50 tasks that you're like amazing at? So these days I try to stick to, um, I do my own like social media marketing and I got a lot of a lot of leads from that. I'm good at negotiation. I'm really good at deal structure. Um, I'm good at identifying opportunities. Um, if someone puts an opportunity in front of me, I can usually figure out if it's an opportunity or if it's not something to pursue. Um, and I, pri- I try to base most of my operations around that, being able to just identify opportunities, structure it well. Um, I do a lot of partnerships. Um, I was partnership adverse for most of my life, but now I have lots of partners. Um, and they're all one-offs, never a complete partner, but I'll have like one partner on one house because they brought me the house and they wouldn't sell it to me, for example. So, you know? so elaborate on that a little bit more. So these are both rehabs. These are properties that you keep. Is it all, all across the board or do you limit it to a specific exit? Um, so I don't, I mean, I, I do, I treat every deal individually, of course. So like, for example, I had a guy that I had never met before. Um, he found me through a lender and um, he had a, he had a deal uh, in a three family house. Um, but he wouldn't sell it. He was insistent that he take it down himself. He really, really wanted to do it. 
but he didn't have the means. He couldn't do it. So I agreed to partner with him. Um, and so we became partners on this one, three family flip. And that's how I gained some of my partners. Um, people will bring me things and I recognize it as an opportunity. I was able to tell that it was a deal and, you know, I have a new partner. And when that house sells, the partnership is over. Maybe we move on to another, maybe we don't. Um, and I do a lot of that stuff. So what's the difference in the, uh, in your bottom line, since you've gotten more focused on what you're good at and delegated out everything else? Like better, much better. So one, one thing that changed was I became bankable. So I can now refinance properties. Um, obviously that's a life changer for a landlord that has a lot of equity and no money in the bank. Um, uh, what else? Um, what was the question again? What did change? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm just kind of wondering, like, like, like it, we're kind of just expanding on the less I do, the more I make, like, like if you had a ballpark, like you're making 10 X on the money that you're used to make, you were used to making when you're doing everything. Or so I won't, I won't chase small flips. Like, um, I used to, I used to not look at a flip unless I could make 30 grand net. Um, and now my number's 50, which means that I'm not going to get most of the deals because there are, there are many other flippers who will do a flip for less than 50. Right. Um, so I'm doing a lot less. Um, but I do that mostly because I'm afraid the downturn will happen. So if you're renovating five houses at a time and the downturn comes and you're stuck with five houses, um, you know, that's a big deal. So I try to be as safe as I can. So my number is 50 now. Um, that's why I've only done, you know, uh, five so far, five and a half. Um, but, uh, every one I do has a better profit. Um, so that's helpful. And I have to work less hard. It's less work to flip five than it is to flip 20, obviously. Um, so that's been helpful. And, um, you also get a lot of time to just do what you want, you know, like, um, my business meetings, when I have to meet someone for business, I, I always choose a bar or a restaurant because I can, you know, and I have the time to do it. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have to go home and do chores. I don't have to, uh, do paperwork or bookkeeping or any of that stuff. I delegate all of that stuff. Um, I don't do any contracting myself. I've never been handy. That was actually really helpful, by the way, not being handy. Um, usually people consider that a negative, but for me, it was a positive because I never attempted to do any contractor type work. I never even tried. I, I have a hard time putting together like Ikea furniture. You and, were talking to two of the least handy people. Right. You know what? It's a blessing, right? And where we are, it's a blessing. It's not a blessing if you aren't doing what we're doing, maybe, but for us, it's a blessing. Yeah. Because now I can renovate 12 houses at a time because I don't swing any hammers. Yeah. Jim almost burnt his house down. Oh, yeah. How'd you do that? I tried to switch an outlet. Wow. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. That's uh, how handy I'm sure I am. It sounded like a good idea at the time. It, yeah, and it should have been okay, but <laughs> apparently if you cut the uh, rubber too, you know, if you cut the rubber too short and then the other, the wires kind of connect without the rubber, yeah, uh, that can, can cause <laughs> some smoke. So, and, you know, too smart, <laughs> not handy. So, well, not handy at all. Yeah, but, um, we agree with you there. Um, okay. So, and then, so you mentioned now kind of like with where you're at, you're like expanding out from even real estate, David. Uh, so, I am. Like, what does that look like? Or how are you, like, what are you doing there, man? All right. So the, so the mentality, my mentality was the real estate market will correct. Uh, I don't know if it's fair to call it a crash, but it probably is fair. Um, and I was early, you know, I mean, people have been saying the real estate market is going to crash for like four years now, five years ago. People are like, oh, the real estate's going to crash, you know, watch out, watch out. And, you know, you can't time it, right? If we could time it, we'd all be very rich off of that. Um, but it's important to be early rather than late. So I was looking for businesses that were recession proof. And so I settled on a liquor store and a car dealership. Um, they're recession proof. Everybody still needs to drive and liquor stores probably even do better business in a recession. So, um, I quickly decided that the liquor store did not, uh, didn't make sense. Unfortunately, after I bought it, um, but I ended up selling it. I did. Okay. Um, and I kept the car dealership. Um, and then it's, it sounds like a ridiculous story, but, um, I don't watch TV barely at all, but when I do, I look for shark tank. Um, it's like my favorite show. It's the only one I want to see when I'm watching something on TV. So that's how I learned about valuation. And then one day it just dawned on me, like, God, how come I can't do that? You know? So they, they own a 
portion of multiple businesses, but they operate none of them. And I'm like, oh, I want to do that. And so I, I just kind of looked for opportunities that made sense like that. And so I ended up buying a firehouse subs franchise. Um, I'm the only, I have the only firehouse subs in Connecticut. Um, and it takes me zero hours to run and I'm a 25% owner. Um, I am a 50% owner of a business that sells uh, pain management units out of the mall. They're called tens units with a little sticky pad and they, they zap you and they jolt you and make your, your muscles contract. You know, what those things are. And so, uh, I use them for drinking games mostly, but they're for pain management. And so I'm 50% of, uh, <laughs> drink percent of what those. <laughs> What was what was the main theme from the Doors to Deals episode today? I'll oh, just get it up. Yeah, <laughs> just, well, we talked about meeting. We talked about liquor store. <laughs> so it gets it gets better. I uh, I got into a company. I'm a I'm a I think I'm a sixty percent of owner uh, of a business that grows marijuana in Canada. Um, I hope to do something in marijuana in the United States also, but it's I know there's a lot of opportunity, but it's also very hard to see where the best opportunities are. Um, so, but I found one in Canada. So do that. Um, just yesterday, I closed on a pawn shop in South Carolina. I am 50% owner of uh, Rick's Friendly Pawn in South Carolina, Florence, South Carolina. Um, super odd, I know. Um, okay, so uh, any any more before we start asking some questions on these, because I'm intrigued. <laughs> oh, and I, well, I do Airbnb, and then I also rent to traveling nurses, and then I also started a construction company because I wasn't doing many deals, but I had the ability to. And so I am now renovating houses for uh, other flippers, you know, friends and competitors. Um, and just, that doesn't make as much money as flipping a house on your own. But, you know, it allows me to do a lot more renovation work. And I designed that also so where I'm a 50% owner and my partner does all the heavy lifting. And I, I do work a little bit in that, in that company because um, I provide the jobs. I get, I'm a sales guy. Okay. So I think that's it. In Firehouse, you don't have any hours pain management zero zero your marijuana company zero and then pawn zero zero what was the last one pawn shop uh pawn shop zero yep the construction company you know four or five hours a week okay so then on the first four firehouse pain management marijuana and pawn shop talk about those deal structures a little bit like did were they all the same were they all different how did they come about Hey guys, for those of you that are local to St. Louis, I wanted to make sure you knew about an amazing resource that we have uh, to help do some extra deals. Uh, you can email our team at deals at three doors.com. And just so you know, we do deals with other investors all the time. Like it's been hundreds and hundreds over the years and we've averaged over a hundred deals with other investors per year um, for the, over the last five years. Uh, we can straight up buy the deal if you're looking for, if you have a wholesale under contract that you want to sell, if you need funding uh, to, to finance a flip or like you're doing a burst strategy, we have funding available for you. If uh, you're trying to wholesale a deal, we're doing JV wholesale deals with uh, with other wholesalers that, quite frankly, some of the deals we're putting together um, for a beginner or an intermediate investor, uh, they'd probably be walking away from uh, because we have systems and processes and we have buyers in place that are paying top dollar for these properties. So um, make sure you use this resource. And the best way to get a, uh, and the only, and the easiest way is to uh, just send us an email deals at three doors.com. All right, back to the episode. Okay, so then on the first four firehouse pain management, marijuana, and pawn shop. Talk about those deal structures a little bit. Like, did were they all the same? Were they all different? How did they come about? So, um, you remember the part where I went from 140 to 90 units in the last yeah. few years, right? Yeah. So that gave me some capital. So I have usually been the money person. So firehouse subs, for example, um, it's a funny story. My, my landscaper calls me one day and he's all excited. And he says, Hey Dave, you want to buy firehouse subs with me? And I said, no. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't even know that. Right? I said, no, like I have no interest in a restaurant and even less interest in a franchise. Right. And he's like, oh, like he's sound a little deflated. And he says, well, can I, can I talk to you anyway? Can I bring my friend? And like, you're just a smart guy in business. And I just want to, I just, I just want some advice, I guess. And I'm like, yeah, sure, man. I got time for you. Come on in. So he comes to my office with the former manager of Firehouse Subs who has lost his job because the business got foreclosed on. 
So it turns out that a firehouse subs, you know, rental, it's a rental property. We don't own the property, but the build out was $390,000. Um, he had to put a hundred down and he had financed like 290 and he still owed like 280 on it and he lost it. And so firehouse subs has no presence in Connecticut. They're just, they're big in like Florida, but they have no presence up here. And so the guy is talking and he's showing me these financial documents about how the company works and how it could go. And I didn't want to admit to him that I didn't know how to read them. So I pretended and (laughs) (laughs) make it till you make it. (laughs) Yeah. And then he says, he says, they'll sell it to me for 60,000, including the franchise fee. And I'm like, 60,000. I'm like, that's like free. And the build out was all together. All the equipment was there. We only had to put a few things in. Um, so for 60,000, what I did was I lent 60,000 to the business. I didn't even invest it. It was a loan. And I learned that from watching Shark Tank also. And so I get my $60,000 back over two years plus interest. And I'm a 25% owner in perpetuity. And I don't have to do anything. Okay. So then on that 60K, just to maybe explain a little bit further, normally firehouse subs cost how much to franchise? So it's th- it was three ninety for the build out with the franchise fee. I don't know what the fee was for us. They they gave us ten thousand for the franchise fee, which I think was discounted, and then fifty thousand for the business that they had foreclosed on. Well, it's mostly for the contents. Okay, and so then you've owned that since when? Um, I think we're we're about fourteen months in. And how's it been so far? Uh, it's been okay. Honestly, it doesn't make a ton of money. I'm not going to make enough at firehouse subs to cover my bar tabs this year, but it's, uh, it's fun. It's like, you know, cool. I get to own it. One of the coolest things, my daughter can walk to firehouse subs from her high school and she gets a sub for free and all her friends think it's the coolest thing. And, um, one of the other best things that I like about it, um, I have been able to provide my friends, kids with their very first jobs, uh, three times now. And like, it's been a while. So you, we don't really remember what it was like, how intimidating it is to go to a job interview when you're 16. Yeah. And I was able to make it easy on them and they got their first job and paycheck. And like, that was so cool. Something I hadn't thought of when I bought it. Um, I enjoy that piece of it. And also firehouse subs, um, they're, uh, they're not their, there's their structure or their company. Uh, I don't know the word for it, but they give back to first responders. They right. take a portion of the profit and they have a nonprofit that, gives out equipment to, you know, police, fire, and uh, EMS. And so it gives you, a, being the owner of that, gives me a better relationship with my local, uh, you know, police department and fire department and EMS. And they appreciate that we buy them some equipment. My uh, firehouse subs bought the city of Bristol, the uh, jaws of life for the fire department. Awesome. That was pretty cool. Yeah, it's really good. So then let's move on to paint management. So 50%, can you go into that that company a little bit? So paint management, this is my, this is my smallest one. So what this was, was this was a guy who was selling these products for someone else. Um, and he was a really strong salesman and he, he left, I think he left his job for a woman. So he went somewhere else and they, it was, he was selling out of state, he came here for a woman back home for a woman. Um, and he really wanted to do it on his own and he knew where to get the equipment and he knew, um, how to sell it. He was, he was just good at it. So it required a pretty small investment, just buy some inventory and rent a spot at the mall. And um, again, it's a loan. So I get the loan back plus interest. And I get um, on this one, I my cut of this is 10% of gross sales. So it's a product with a high markup. So when he sells $100 in product, I get 10. And so I asked him, like, how much do you think that you um, net after you sell a product? And he's like, oh, I think I, I think I net like, 60% or something like that, like a pretty good markup um, after everything. I'm like, all right, well, I want the first 10 and you can keep the last 50. And the other 40% goes to, you know, your overhead and product and rent and all that stuff. And and that's if he hit his sales goals. So he set really lofty sales goals, which I didn't know at the time were unrealistic. So he is not making that, but I still get my 10% and it's enough for me. And it's like residual it takes zero hours. And I didn't want to be greedy. He is putting in uh, lots of hours. That is a very hour intensive job and he deserved the lion's share for doing it. So I felt good about that arrangement and he couldn't go into business without me because he couldn't put together the investment. So both of these involve me putting up hundred percent of the money. How, how much investment was needed on that one? That one, uh, 10, 10 grand. And then does that one, uh, so you said you own 50%, but you're getting 10% gross sales. So, right. So the owner, 
the ownership percentage is not the same as the compensation. Correct. Right. 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 I mean, is, is there upside in that ownership? It, it sounds like it's more of a, uh, you're, yeah, you're selling, but it's a sales, but it's almost a, a, a service in a, in a way, because I don't know, can, can you sell that? Is it a sell? No, you're, you're right. You're exactly right. Normally owning 50% of the business is cool. If one day you're going to sell it, but this business has no value to sell because it's based on the salesman. The salesman is the business. And so if he was ever to be like, Hey, David, I've decided to quit and I want to go somewhere else. Um, the business really has no value. We would just close the doors. So then, so the reason I asked that question, and this is a good follow-up would be, so then did you, how did you protect that 10 K investment to make sure that he doesn't say in three months after you did it, Hey, I'm gone. So there is no good way to protect that investment. That is, uh, there is some gamble there. There is, um, I mean, it's the kind of inventory that like, you know, I could lean inventory, but that's not effective really when he has possession of all the inventory. Right. Um, the, the kiosk is a lease. There's a, a few fixtures on the kiosk that I paid for, but again, he has possession. Um, so if he, in three months, if he was to say, I'm out of here, um, I would lose my investment and I don't think I have much recourse there. Gotcha. How is and, that? and that's one of, and that's one of the reasons I kept it small. I didn't um these investments, both of these are not like if they went bad, they're not life changing. Yep. Yeah. How did um uh, how's that one working out for you? Uh it's going okay. Um, you know, the guy like he hit a slow period and just skated by into the holidays, but it looks like he made it. And apparently uh in November and December in the mall is when you really clean up. So uh, hopefully in the next couple of months we'll see some good numbers. Um but like I said, his uh, his projections of like his what his target sales numbers were unrealistic. But I didn't know that at the time um, because I had never done business here. But again, if I'm getting 10% of gross sales, I mean, you know, if he sells half of his sales goal, I mean, I'm still happy, I guess, right? And and hopefully uh, everyone appreciates that we're going through these. And you you don't mind sharing the last two because my thought process in going through these is. You know, most of our content is about real estate, but I love talking about business in general. So like all these deal structures is just great. So if we can move on to the next one, marijuana company, let's talk about that. If you can. Well, why? So, so, and what in your head is relevant on connect? Like, let's expand so, on that connect the so, dot between yeah, real estate so, and business. Sorry, good call, yeah. Jim. So to me, deal structure is so important within real estate. And what you've done with your experience with real estate and Shark Tank is taking those two and said, hey, how can I do that with a different thing, which is now businesses, right? And to me, it's always been the people who went at the highest level in real estate uh, find opportunities where others didn't see it. It's not that they weren't there. It's just that they didn't see it. So you're, I'll go back to your first example. When you first started buying houses and we first started talking today, you said, Hey, I bought four houses. I put my personal name on them. I did everything wrong. Yada, yada, yada. And guess what? Then I couldn't get loans. So what did you do? You found another way to get loans. You were creative. You utilized private funds. You utilized creative financing or owner financing, another name for it. And you found ways to do deals. And so deal structure is so vital to having a successful real estate career, in my opinion. Um, and that's why I think there's so much value in going through each of these businesses as we are. If I was to put dollar per hour on any one task that was good at. I think deal structure is probably the one that pays me back the most. I mean, yeah. And it's, and it's all about how you think. I mean, one person would say, why I can't do this because I got foreclosed on what David said was, well, how can, how might I do this? Because, seeing- because I got foreclosed on and that the difference in that question guys is the difference between David now owning a hundred houses still in six different businesses as a shareholder that he doesn't have to do anything with. Yeah. It's also, I mean, some of this is luck. It's not a totally fair example, but when firehouse subs came along, um, if someone said to a thousand people out there, you know, do you want to own firehouse subs? Like most people are going to say no. Right. And I said, no also. So in fairness, I was lucky enough that he asked me, Hey, can I still sit down with you? And I said, yes, I have time for you because we're friends. Um, And then my no changed to a yes once I realized there was an opportunity in front of me. 
So if you say no to firehouse subs and you are a hard no and your mind is closed to it, I mean, someone could be bringing you something on a, that's a fire sale. And that's what this was. Right. No, I, I mean, timing's everything, right? You just said it. Timing, timing is part of our decision making too. And if if you hadn't been able to sell those properties, timing might not have been right for any of these. Yeah. Timing and, and keeping an open mind. You know, I tell people that I will listen to anything and you know, bring me something. And if they're like, hey, David, let's let's make pizza for a living, I'm gonna be like, Well, I don't think so, but yeah, I got an hour for you. What do you got? Let's hear it. So, so some marijuana, you like smoking the heebie jeebie. So actually I don't, I don't smoke. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't really projecting onto you, but I, it, was, <laughs> it was a good, good transition. <laughs> uh, I just, I just hope everyone else smokes because that's what I grow now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's legal in many States. Yeah. Yeah. Laws are always changing, which is actually one of the uncertainty pieces of this one. So, um, so this one in, in Canada, there is some massive, massive kind of license that you can get that costs millions of dollars and you can grow all the weeds you want. And I think there's like two companies in Canada who have done this. And apparently they're struggling a little bit because they have this huge overhead um, that they have to cover. Because remember, when you when you grow weed legally in any state or wherever, you are still competing with guys on the street, growing it in their basement, getting it shipped in from Mexico or California, Oregon, wherever. You cannot charge too much for your weed because you um, or the guys on the street people will just go to the street um it will always be there that black market so somebody very smart um he built the huge warehouse that you would grow weed in and he cut it up into little rooms and then he franchised out each room so that i own one of the rooms and by owning one of the rooms now i have this smaller license the smaller license is much easier to get in canada costs a lot less and I, we, nobody had to pay the millions of dollars. And so these guys don't own the weed, but they rent me the building. They charge me to build it out. I have to hire their security staff. I have to hire their growers. I hire their salesmen to sell the weed. They get a cut when they sell it. They make money off of me like a dozen different ways, but it's my weed. But it's also totally residual. And and let, let me, I, I assume I know the answer. However, do they also sell the weed for you? Yes, they sell the weed for you. They they uh, built you a turnkey weed business. Yes, they build you a turnkey weed business because they're not allowed to own it all. They can only own one unit with the smaller license and the bigger license is prohibitive. So um, this was a random, there's a random guy on Facebook just reached out to me, saw me posting somewhere. And um, I was like, well, what do you got? You know, you interested in doing business in Canada? No. Well, what do you got? <laughs> so um, I ended up buying into that and I, I have uh, five partners, four partners, four partners on that because I didn't have all the money for that one. And it was more expensive. So I had to, I wanted to split the risk up a little bit. Um, it's too early to tell how it's doing. So I can't tell you how it is because uh, it's 10 months to build out and we're about five months in. So it's going to be another five months before I start getting checks if it works out. But it's a, it's a, you know, pretty large operation. They're pretty smart. They want to come to America. They're figuring out the best way to go. It looks like Michigan is the number one choice for people trying to grow weed in the United States. Their laws are somehow better than others. I also knew enough that I don't want to take the time to learn all of the laws and the different states to find the best one. I'm going to let somebody else do that stuff because I don't want to read all the paperwork and read legislation and none of that stuff. I'll let someone else figure it out. And, you know, someone will bring me an opportunity to get into and hopefully I'm able to see it and invest in it. And this is another one where it's zero, uh, zero hours. And, uh, Oh, the other cool thing by having all these little, little, um, rooms they're they're a craft weed business. They're specifically focusing on like high end, like the, you know, weed has like names and stuff yeah, yeah. so that they can grow different amounts of different kinds in each room. And it's like craft beer, but it's craft weed. And they're counting on that high end market to be their customer. So they're not growing, a ton of weed that's like dirt weed. Um, one example that they gave me was uh, Jamaica. In Jamaica, you can grow all the weed you want and you can export it anywhere you want. That's how Jamaica's laws are written. But nobody's importing Jamaican weed because they just grow a bunch of dirt weed and it sucks, apparently. So I've heard. So these guys want to go the opposite direction and have higher end weed as a, a craft beer drinkers. I'm sure you are them or know them. Um, you'll pay more for craft beer. That's good. Yeah, so it's interesting. We were talking last Thursday and Friday. We had our our 2022 uh, 
business meeting. And one of the things we were talking about was the, the, what are you as a business? Are you um, convenience, quality, or price? So it sounds like they're going for quality over other people are going for price. Yeah. And like, and so specifically it's an exercise that's like, and how do you want to innovate? Like, what do you, like, what is your value proposition? And you can't be a lot of times entrepreneurs, we think we can be all three. Well, there's a reason why Walmart doesn't have high end, high, high end stuff, right? Like it just doesn't work. You can, you know, so, so yes, we are going through the exercise of like, like, who are we? How do we want to innovate? What do we want to do? And anytime you can get crystal clear on your vision, um, it's a powerful thing because now you're, now you are equipped with what you're not going to do when that idea comes up that doesn't fit uh, the vision for your business, right? So, um, so absolutely. Yeah. So, sorry, that was a little bit of a tangent. You said you have five or six people involved in that marijuana, and you're the yes. six, and you're sixty percent owner. So tell us a little bit about that deal structure because I think you did well. So it was, uh, that was pretty much about the capital contribution. So what happened was, I think there was five of us and, uh, I, I took, I took as much as I was comfortable with. And then whatever was remaining, I asked my investors, you know, how much do you want? This is what's available. And so four of them said yes. And, uh, we worked out the percentages and then one of them changed his mind. I said, you know, it's not too late. You can change your mind, no pressure. And one of them backed out. And then I had more money by then. So I just took his. <laughs> so that's how I got to 60. So the one thing I would encourage you to do moving forward, because it sounds like you want to continue to do things like this and be creative. Uh, and we learned this from Eric Shelley, uh, who is also a leadership board member. And we've had him on this um, podcast as well. He is phenomenal at putting deals together. And what he has taught us, and, and I would relate to you, is there is absolutely value to bringing opportunities to people that you know. So what I just heard was that you put in 60% of the money and that's awesome. And if you want to continue to do that, that's perfectly fine. And you could very well put in 40% of the money and still be 60% owner because mm. there's a premium for having that opportunity. Well, you, I mean, you could put $0 in and, and to keep 10 or 20% because you're packaging and structuring the deal, not even not even put a, a penny into it. That's Eric's model. Yeah. You're, you're exactly right. You know, the only reason I didn't do it is because we we're good friends. And also this was unproven. Um, this isn't something where I'm like, hey, the checks come look at these financial reports. Like this is something that has to have a little bit of, of faith and you have to believe that they're you know not going to rob you in the middle of the night and yeah. go away. So those are the only reasons, but I that model is way better. Um, there is definitely value. There is well, definitely you, value. Like you've you said, done it before, yeah. <laughs> yeah, bringing bringing value to others is worth something. Yeah, and it's and this kind of gets me like one of my pet peeves when I hear people say, "Well, I don't have money to do this." It's like, well, no, you, you just need to be more resourceful. <laughs> like, you don't. Yes, money is needed to do deals. I'm not arguing that, but it doesn't have to be your money. Yes, money is needed to invest in a firehouse subs. And it doesn't have to be your money, you know, like, I mean, even the firehouse subs, like 60 K is needed. The person comes and needs the 60 K. I mean, David could have called up a different friend and said, Hey, do you have 60 K and we'll do two, 12 and a half percent and split the, split the business, you know, like if someone's willing to take that now, I agree with David. I agree with what you're saying too, is that like, like at some point, like it's helpful to have skin in the game if you're going to promote that to a friend, right. Or, you know, there, there's kind of like a, you know, uh, like kind of like your own integrity element of it too, right? But yeah. but it's all a white blank canvas that you can kind of paint on however you want. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So lap yesterday, a pawn shop. Pawn shop. Not only a pawn shop, a pawn shop that's really far away. Right. Connecticut. So there's, there's, there's some trust. There's some trust involved in this one. This is one that is uh, not as easy to say, like, you know, like, uh, hey, everyone should do this because that's not the case. Um, I was dealing with a guy uh, when I was in the car business previously, um, probably for 15 years. And I bought lots of cars from him and I knew him and uh, he retired. Um, he's like, I think he's he's like 60, early 60s now. Um, and uh, he retired to South Carolina and uh, he got bored. 
So he got a job at a pawn shop. He likes negotiating and this and that. And so he gets paid 500 bucks a week. And he's in a, he's at a pawn shop and he's just doing his thing, you know. And one day the owner says, hey, uh, this pawn shop, he had a chain of pawn shops. And he says, this pawn shop performed the weakest. I'm going to close it. But I like you. I'd like you to come to one of my other stores. And so my guy says, oh, well, you know, that's too bad, you know. And so he goes to the landlord and he says, hey, how much is the rent here? And so the rent was 1100 bucks a month, which is like for a pretty big place. And that's not triple net either. I'm like, that's like free. South Carolina's like cost of living is so low. So he says, okay, I'm going to rent it. So he rents it. And then he goes to uh, the owner of the store and he says, hey, I'm not going to come with you to your next store. I'm going to keep this store. And I rented the building and I'm going to open up, get my own pawn license. And then he says, hey, you have all this inventory here. The owner of the business that was going to close it has a, the source full. And he goes, can I, can I sell the stuff that's in your, in the store? Can you leave it all here? And I'll give you 75% when you sell it and I'll keep 25% for my profit. And the owner didn't want to move it. And he said, yeah. And so for 1100 bucks, he had a whole store that was full. And I was like, wow, that was really good. And he didn't call me before that. I did. That was him. And he's not like, he's not normally like this guy, like, uh, so we had lost touch for a few years. I mean, we kept in touch on Facebook, but he reached out to me and he says, David, I, I did this thing and I think you're the guy that can help me. And I'm like, all right, what do you got? And he described this to me and I'm like, geez, a pawn shop in South Carolina. Like how, how would I track that? How would I, how would I keep track of that? I mean, it sounds interesting. And, and you know, he's like, so he's like, I need cash to be able to put out on the street. Cause remember the guy took all his cash out the owner. So at a pawn shop, you have to have a, a bankroll where you can continually have money out on the street. And if people don't grab their things, then you get to resell their things at a profit. But mostly you want the interest. Pawn shops are based off getting high interest for money that's let out. So he needed money. And I agreed. I provided the money. And he's just he's taking a salary. So he's taking his weekly check. Um, but he's also working there. And then we're splitting the business as owners. Is so he I get half. Did he stick with the 500 or did he get bumped up? I'm just curious. Yeah, he stuck with the 500. There you go. So, wow. So kudos to that guy for 1100 bucks. He now has an operational business with you. I was really impressed because he, he is, I don't know that he's like, uh, I, he just kind of stumbled into it. And I was like, that was brilliant. Great job. You yeah. know? So one of the things that I, I feel we need to cover and we're, we're getting short on time. I want to make sure that we cover your thought process and we have a little bit, but like when you're going through each of these potential opportunities for businesses, like what's your criteria? What's your parameters? Like um, Sean's described it at, at leadership boardroom, like people that he, you know, he wanted in the group, like he put them into three different categories. And like, if they fit into the one category, you know, that was someone he'd pursue and make sure it was a good fit. So what is your uh, filtering system to make sure you're going after good opportunities? So my number one filter is my time. Um, I, I wasn't always like this, but um, the businesses that I get into have to have very low or zero time commitments. And it could be after sta stabilizing them. Like I can get into a business, work on it for a little while, but if I can get out in six months or a year or whatever, and then it functions without me, then I'm okay with that. Um, but if you said, you know, hey, David, here's a, here's a job. Uh, you got to work 80 hours a week at this job, but I'll pay you a million dollars an hour. You know, I don't, I, I, I don't want to work 80 hours a week, a million dollars an hour, of course, is fantastic, but I only want to work. I want to work like 10 hours and quit, <laughs> you know? Um, so at some point you have to, you know, time versus uh, money is the equation and the balance that we all have to look into. And so time has become much more valuable to me than the money. Cause I, I have enough now that I can cover my bar tabs. So I'm good. So, um, after, after time, it has to be something that, um, I, I'm just looking for like some value and some opportunity. And the mentality here is I don't expect all of these businesses to thrive or even succeed. Um, if I get into 10 businesses and three fail and four break even, and three are successful, that's probably going to be a win for me. The other, the other, one of the other filters is that losing one of these businesses cannot seriously change my life. So if any one of these went under, and even if I took a big loss, like I, I can recover, there's none of these 
that have the ability to put me into bankruptcy. Um, there's none of these that have the ability to like, you know, get me in real trouble somehow. You know, that's the other, that's the second filter. Well, and another really good question. So firehouse, uh, the pain management and now the pawn shop, not, not marijuana, because that's more of a conglomerate or a corporation, it seems. But the other three are, are like really intimate with your relationship with them or had an intimate relationship. So is there some kind of uh, common theme or common traits, characteristics that those three have that also could be part of your filtering system here? So, so may, the answer is sometimes, right? So the, the pain management. I knew he was a really good salesman and he, he really sell that product. Um, he was lacking all of the other skills needed to run a business, but I also have a full-time bookkeeper on staff. Um, so one of the things that I also bring to this is we do the books in house. It's one of the ways that I can keep some control over what's going on, or I'll notice if something is way off. Um, so as a, as a good example, like um, being 50, 50 on a business, right. Um, they're there doing all the work every day. And my, my end is like the, say the bookkeeping and cutting the checks and handling insurance and utilities, or like say it's permits or whatever, but I've delegated all of my end. So they, it does in the partnership, I am bringing value. I am getting tasks done, but I've delegated it all. So that's why it becomes zero. A lot of times um, I have tasks that are my responsibility to do in most of these businesses, but I don't actually do any of them. Awesome. I had to the some, best of my ability. I had some other questions, but we're getting close on time. So I, I, I know you probably have at least the last one, but real quick, this is a fun one. So you talk, right. you talked earlier about delegating to the nth and you actually just brought it back up. What is the silliest thing you've ever delegated? All right. I don't, I don't, I don't think my staff can hear me in the other room, but <laughs> so I, I delegate this is something, but I can, if I get an email and I got to print something out, I, I forward it to them and ask them to print it and bring it to me. And I, I do that. Cause I like, they'll, they'll send me something. And I like, I don't want them to, I don't want them to send me anything. Like, I don't want to, <laughs> I don't want to deal with any documents because my, 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 um, my organization skills are very low. My attention to detail is very low on that predictive index, for example. So like I lose documents all the time. It's a common frustration here. I don't know how to solve it except to not have any documents. So I make sure they all have the documents. So I send it to them all the time. And I try to have as little paper around as possible. And it's sending, sending instead of hitting print, emailing it to them and telling them to print it is probably one of the sillier things that I delegate. You know uh, yourself, man. That's awesome. I love it. Um, hey, so when you, I'm just kind of curious, when you're managing some of these businesses, uh, do you have any sort of like owner's beating, like once a month or once a quarter or? Is there any sort of kind of like one-on-one -on -one meeting with, with the operator? So I probably do that a little less than I should. We firehouse subs were meeting quarterly. Um, the car dealership meeting as needed. Um, I'll meet every less than once a month. Um, probably should be a little more. Um, the pain management. No, I haven't just connect, connect on Facebook. Um, uh, marijuana. No, because of the management out there is there in Canada. So um, my, my connections to these managers are and owners partners, um, is mostly electronic, mostly over messenger. Um, not as many in-person meetings as there probably should be. Gotcha. And then, um, if you had, if we kind of went back to, you know, five years ago and, um, yeah, actually for your journey, since you've been doing this long, let's, let's say 10 years ago, uh, if you went back 10 years ago and had to give yourself one piece of actionable advice um you know what would get you the, the most results over the over the last 10 years oh that's easy buy bitcoin, <laughs> buy bitcoin. is that is that cheating <laughs> that is cheating <laughs> <laughs> i'm surprised no one's uh said that one before. Easy. Buy bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. I love it. do you ask do you ask everybody that same question i, I do oh i try to i don't every time okay. I, I, um, it's important to uh, to get something simple and actionable. Yeah. If it was business, if it was business related. Um, so what was that 2011? I had recently met Robin Thompson um, at, at my RIA 
and I just gone to the real, like I was new to all of this stuff. I was, I was struggling along for a few years with no mentor or anything. And it would be to, uh, it would be to get a coach and join a mastermind. That's what I would tell myself 10 years ago. That would probably make the biggest difference in my life. I love that. Yeah, that's so true. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've made drastic changes in your life since you did with Sean. Yeah, very much have. Was that your first mastermind or coach? Yeah. It was. Wow. That's, I'm, I'm yeah. slightly surprised it took you that long even to have a coach, not necessarily a mastermind, but a coach. I, I didn't know what a coach did. Nobody told me <laughs> I had, um, I've, I've gone to some real estate events. Like I went to go see some of the speakers from stage and taken some of those boot camps, but never had a coach and never had anyone explain to me what a coach did. It's something that is very underestimated and underutilized. And like, like we now know, cause we, we run in this circle, especially in like you guys in St. Louis, right? Yeah. Like St. Louis is like this Mecca of like coaching and classes and like, all these very smart investors and, and people that understand what life in air is, you know, you guys are, you guys are like uh, way ahead of many other areas in the country. Connecticut is in the stone age of this kind of stuff. None of my friends talk about this stuff unless I teach them something. None of them have ever heard of this, these kind of concepts, um, all the balance and all this investment stuff and, you know, coaching and working less and putting your, you know, uh, setting your schedule around the stuff you want to do first and what's left is what you can use to work with. You know, like these are unheard of concepts in Connecticut that uh, they just don't come up. There's opportunity there for you. There may be. <laughs> <laughs> yep, yeah, there is. Just need to find a guy to run the business. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Dude, I appreciate you, man. Thanks for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much. It's been great. Hey, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I enjoyed it. And then if uh, anybody has a business that uh, they want to throw your way for an idea to invest in, how do they get a hold of you, David? <laughs> oh, the best the best ways, uh, two ways. Email david080 at Yahoo, david080 at Yahoo. And then I'm on Facebook all the time. My name is David Haverfeld. Uh, last name is H-A-B as in boy, E-R-F-E-L-D. All right, guys, that's a wrap on today's episode. Once again, go to doorstodeals.com slash 069 for the full uh, for the full show notes and, and resources that we have on the, the website. Uh, and again, if you uh, if you have any interest in passive income opportunities, uh, we are in on the mission to help 250 agents and our clients become financially free over the next 10 years. Uh, we've been pretty successful at it so far. We've been generating about $130,000 a month in passive income. And and anyway, long story short, we can help you with that too if that's what you're looking for. Just send us over an email, deals at three doors.com. Once again, that's deals at three doors.com. And we can uh, and we can get you rolling. So that's it for today. Go out, live your purpose, and above all else, go after your dreams. Till next time. Thanks for tuning into the show. For more episodes and resources that will unlock doors to deals, check out our website doorstodeals.com.